Tesla Motors made headlines recently as its share price surged past $300 a share, making it the largest U.S. automaker, surpassing traditional car manufacturers like Ford and GM, who have been in business for over 100 years. Tesla Motors doesn't make any money yet. They actually lost over $200 million last year. But its future seems so bright and Tesla's growth seems so assured, investors are willing to almost pay any price for its stock. The Tesla story reminds me of another time in financial history, when investors would clamor for growth stocks at any price because their financial future and growth would seem assured. They would be the future of corporate America. The group of growth stocks was termed the Nifty 50, and the time was the early 1970s. As you might have guessed from its name, the Nifty 50 was 50 companies named by Morgan Guarantee Group that were one decision stocks, meaning that you simply buy shares in these companies and never sell. You bought, sat back, and watched the profits roll in. These 50 companies included cutting edge technology companies at the time, like Xerox, IBM, Bristol Myers, Merck, and Texas Instrument Group. Also consumer staples with strong brand recognition, who were seen as corporate titans that can do no wrong. Coca-Cola, Gillette, Philip Morris, Procter & Gamble, McDonald's, American Express, and Disney. These are all names that we would recognize today, over 50 years later. The group also included companies that might not be as recognizable today. Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing, Squibb, Upjohn, Louisiana Land and Exploration, and Schlitz Joe Brewing. But in the early 70s, these were prominent companies with supposedly bright futures ahead of them. These were strong, proven corporate companies that seemed to have boundless growth potential. So investors were told not to worry about the share prices of these nifty 50 companies. Even if the price seemed high today, these companies would grow so quickly and so dominantly that any price today can be justified. One of the most popular measuring sticks of value when looking at a company's stock price is the P.E. ratio, or the price-earning ratio. It's simply how much investors are willing to pay today for a company's current earnings. In simplified terms, suppose that a company's stock price is $20 and they had earnings of $1 per share, then its P.E. ratio will be 20. 20 divided by 1 equals 20, meaning that investors are willing to pay $20 for $1 of current earnings from said company. According to the Wall Street Journal, at the time of this video, the S&P 500 has a P.E. ratio of 24.6 meaning investors are willing to pay $24.60 for $1 of current earnings for the S&P 500. Now, if investors think that those earnings could grow substantially in the future, they might be willing to pay a much higher P.E. ratio. Take our early example of paying $20 for $1 of current earnings. Well, if the company grew earnings by 100% or $2 over the year, then the P.E. ratio for the price we paid per share would drop significantly. $20 divided by $2 of earnings equals a P.E. of 10. That kind of substantial earnings growth was what investors were hoping for from the Nifty 50 group. In January 1972, Polaroid had a P.E. ratio of 93.5, meaning investors are willing to pay $93.50 for $1 of current earnings from Polaroid. McDonald's had a P.E. ratio of 59.8, Johnson & Johnson had a P.E. ratio of 55.5, and International Flavors and Fragrance had a P.E. ratio of 57.9. This compared to a market average P.E. ratio of 18.2. As a group, the Nifty 50 had a P.E. ratio of 37.3, more than double the P.E. ratio of the market average. That meant that investors in the Nifty 50 had great expectations that the Nifty 50 would grow earnings substantially in the future. But instead, the stock market crashed, and from 1972 to 1974, the stock market went through a stomach-curdling correction, with the Dow Jones down over 44%. But some of the stocks in the Nifty 50 had it even worse, as investors began doubting if those promised growth and rosy projections would ever materialize. Coca-Cola stock price declined over 66%, Eastman Kodak declined over 58%, McDonald's declined over 63%, and Disney a mind-numbingly loss of over 90% of its value, which to a modern viewer like myself is simply mind-blowing. Many saw the huge blows inflicted on the Nifty 50 during the market correction of 1972-74 to 74 as a tough financial lesson. Don't let your imagination run wild and pay absurd amounts for a growth story. As legendary investor Warren Buffett puts it, 
investors making purchases in an overheated market need to recognize that it may often take an extended period for the value of even an outstanding company to catch up with the price they paid. However, Jeremy Siegel, professor of finance at University of Pennsylvania, provides a different take on the Nifty 50. He argues that investors who bought the entire basket of 50 stocks in the Nifty 50 and held it past the soul-crushing correction of the 1972-74 as a long-term investment, then the Nifty 50's return was comparable to the S&P 500. Professor Siegel calculated that if investors kept the basket of stocks from December 1972 to 1997, roughly 25 years, then the Nifty 50 would have returned an annualized return of 12.7%, which is just shy of the S&P's 500's annualized return of 12.9% for the same period. However, this return assumes that investors rebalance the portfolio of Nifty 50 stocks every year, so that each company only accounted for 2% of the portfolio. Without rebalancing, the Nifty 50 portfolio will return a slightly lower annualized return of 12.4%. But for me, I think that many individual investors didn't buy shares in the entire basket of 50 companies that made up the Nifty 50. Rather, many individual investors probably bought shares in just a few companies in the Nifty 50, companies that they felt strongly about. You would have made a killing if you invested in Disney or Coca-Cola in the 1970s. However, if you bet on Eastman Kodak, your retirement plans today might be a bit dodgy. Now as a footnote, the P-E ratio of Tesla is undefined because Tesla doesn't have any earnings yet. Remember, they lost over $200 million last year. And if you remember elementary math, you can't divide by a zero. Thanks for watching. Please consider liking and subscribing to The Strange World of Econ as it's a great way to support the channel so I can bring you more strange stories from the economics storied history.